Hello, listeners. This is Kat. Welcome back to Put Your Hands Up Podfix. This is the continuation of Reformation. This will be Part 12, Chapters 17 and 18. Chapter 17 Mike led Deku and Togo away while Midnight went to fetch breakfast for them. The students of 1A and 1B were told to go about their business, which led to most of them going outside to gossip. The three third years were about to leave when Sir Nighteye caught their attention and gave them a small shake of his head. Once the common room was empty of the first years, leaving only the pro-heroes and third-year students, Muriel finally spoke up. So, not that I don't appreciate being included in this, but why are we here? You three were a part of the task force that was supposed to rescue Eri, so we only thought it was fair that you were made aware of the full situation, All Might said, coming to stand beside Sir Nighteye. We also are hoping to ask for help when it comes to the new wards of UA. Unlike the first years, you have little to no bias against Toka and Deku, so we are hoping that you three can check in with them sometimes, act as a guiding hand to help steer them on the right path. We're not asking you to be friends with them. Honestly, I don't think you should spend much time around them in general, Night Eye said, folding his arms across his chest. All Might gently bumped his arm against Night Eye's shoulder. Mirai. Yes, we all know what you think, Night Eye, Aizawa snapped. You think we should lock two abused and manipulated teenagers away in prison and send a traumatized child to stay in the hospital. Those two committed crimes, and that girl needs round-the-clock care. Which is what she will get here at UA, Nessie said evenly. Sir Nighteye, you agree to this course of action. That doesn't mean I am happy about it. Regardless, All Might said, we also think you three could act as role models for Eri. She currently looks up to Toga and Deku, so we'd like her to have others with a less... Complicated history to look up to as well. She's still fearful of adults, but she will see you three as kids since you're still in high school. Najiri nodded along. That makes sense, she said happily. We'll be happy to help. Good, thank you. Night Eye glanced at his watch and nudged All Might. When All Might looked down to get a glimpse of the time, he grimaced. I apologize, but Mariah and I must go. If there's anything that you need from me, Nezu, please reach out. With that, All Might had hurried from the room, making it feel a lot more open without his bulk filling it up. Night Eye followed after, the pair leaving the dorms. Aizawa turned to the third years. Go get cleaned up and get some rest. I'll contact you about talking with the new wards. Dude, what was that? Kirishima said, following Bakugo to his room. Get out. I don't want to talk. No, we are going to talk about this. You said that if you had a second chance of seeing Midoriya, that you would apologize to him, that you'd be nicer. But that's not what I saw back there. Bakugo spun around, tears welling in his eyes as his face went red. He's a villain! He saved that girl. So? Who knows what he did before that? And whatever he did, it's my fault. Don't you get it? The reason that Deku became a fucking villain is because he thought that there was literally no other option. He thought that the world was so bad and cruel and against him that being a villain was the only thing that he could do to stay alive. I beat him down and hurt him so badly that he became a criminal. Fuck, Kiri. He thought that it would be safer to live with the League than to live with me and my family. How fucked up is that? Bakako shouted, the tears bubbling over and streaming down his face. He hiccuped before he buried his face into his hands. This is my fault. It's all my fault. I fucking failed him. Kirishima didn't move. He watched as Bakugo sobbed, and for the first time since meeting Bakugo, Kirishima was angry at his friend. You bullied him. Kirishima snapped. You told me that. And remember what I told you? I told you that it wasn't cool, but that it was in the past. But as soon as you saw him, you attacked him, just like you used to. You were angry, I get it. But why were you angry? Were you angry that he had committed crimes, or was it because him being a villain reflects badly on you, because everything that you just said makes it sound like the second? Midoriya, or Deku, or whatever his name is, has probably been through hell. His mom died, he lived with villains, was stuck in a Yakuza base, literally begging the heroes to help with Eri, and when he realized the heroes wouldn't get there in time, he risked his life to save her. He looks crazy skinny and way too pale. Hell, he's probably been going hungry for a while. And did you see that scar on his face? That looked new. He's been through some shit, and none of it had anything to do with you. So stop making this whole thing about you and try to be supportive of him. You're the only other person he knows here besides Toga, so at least try. How? He probably hates me. To be honest, dude, he kind of has a right to, Kirishima said, rubbing at the back of his neck. All you can do is apologize and try to grow. You're going to have to prove to him that you want to change if you want him to ever trust you again. Akago nodded, shakily, sniffling. Do you hate me now, too? Nah, I couldn't hate you. I was just sort of mad. I got it out of my system now. How about you wash up your face, and I'll go get cleaned up, and we can go downstairs to get something to eat. He shrugged but nodded, letting Kirishima nudge him toward his bathroom. When the two met back up in the hall, Kirishima had changed into a pair of sweatpants and a loose t-shirt, which looked much more comfortable than his hero costume. Bakugo had dried his face, and it was nearly impossible to tell he'd been crying. 
There was a barest hint of red in the whites of his eyes, but it was doubtful anyone would notice. Downstairs in the common room, they found the rest of their friend group waiting for them. Baku bro! Kaminari had shouted, hopping up from his seat. Dude, are you okay? I'm fine, Dunsface. Sarah leaned forward, their bulky elbows resting on their knees. You sure? Because your friend just basically came back from the dead. Deku's not my fucking friend. Sure, it sounds like you guys had a falling out, but he made his villain name the nickname that you gave him. Sounds like something a friend would do. Bakuga glared. Deku was a fucking insult, not a nickname. He was always following me around and being useless. And he was always trying to act like a hero even when no one wanted him to. Dumbass is lucky that he didn't get himself killed with how often he went chasing villain fights. Well, isn't he, like, lucky to be alive at this point anyway? Mina asked. Her eyes were closed as she hung upside down on the edge of the couch, her legs over the back. You know, since he's quirkless? It's what I just fucking said. No, I mean since the average lifespan of a quirkless kid nowadays is supposed to be 10 to 12 years old or something close to that. That caught Bakako's attention. The fuck are you talking about? Mina cracked open one eye and looked up at him. When she saw he was serious, she sat up so she was sitting properly. Didn't they teach you this in school? She asked. We had a whole seminar on it when we were kids. Right, I forgot about that. Hiroshima said he turned on Bakugo and continued. So our school did a lecture on quirk and quirkless discrimination. They did it every year for the second graders, and then they did it again in more detail for fifth graders. The teachers didn't usually focus too much on quirkless statistics, but they made a point to tell us that because of the way they get treated, quirkless people have shorter life expectancies. Mina nodded along. I have an aunt who's quirkless, so I asked her about it afterwards, and she told me that today, quirkless kids get bullied really badly and a lot of times get neglected by families. If the kid ends up in the system, they can get abused there, too. Stuff can get so bad for the kids that they end up killing themselves. That or they get killed by someone else. It's, like, crazy sad. It stuck with me growing up, and I always wanted to make a point to be nice to people and get people to get along. That's why you always stood up to those bullies in middle school. You were really good at that. Aw, thanks, Kiri. Yeah, I just know how hard it was for my aunt, and that it's even harder today since quirkless kids are so rare. Did you know that most of the quirkless population are the older generations? It's wild. And when I was a kid, people made fun of me for my mutations, but it got a bit better after those lectures, so I assumed that all schools had them. They obviously worked, so why wouldn't they? Can't believe your school didn't do that, Bakugo. Yeah, well, the teachers of my school were shit. Bakugo grumbled, looking a little shaken. His shoulders collapsed inward, and he made himself smaller. They just let us run wild. Damn. I mean, my school didn't have the lecture either, but at least they kept an eye on us, Kaminari said, leaning into Sarah's side. I didn't know all that stuff about quirkless people. That's really sad, actually. Bakugo, how was Deku treated at your school? Sarah asked. Mina nodded. Yeah, how did people react to him being quirkless? And what was his mom like? Sounds like she was pretty nice. Bakugo shrunk even further in on himself. Auntie was great. She was busy a lot, since she was taking care of Deku on her own. She kind of treated him like glass sometimes, I think. Which makes sense, he's quirkless. At school, school wasn't great for him. What happened? It, it was just bad, okay? Why the fuck do you guys even care? Sarah shrugged. He's going to be in our class. We want to know everything we can about the guy. What happened for you guys to stop talking? Finally, Bakugo exploded, his hands popping menacingly. I don't want to fucking talk about this anymore, shithead. Stop asking questions. Bakugo! The group spun around, startled at the shout. Standing in the doorway to the common room was present Mike, Toga, and Deku behind him. The teens were wearing some spare gym uniforms and looked like they had finally gotten cleaned up. Deku's head was hung as he pressed himself into Toga's side like he was trying to hide. Toga was openly glaring. Mike, who had been the one to shout, was frowning at Bakugo. Stop using your quirk inside the dorms. We don't need you starting a fire, got it? Mike didn't wait for an answer. He just gestured for the two villains to follow him as he led the way out of the dorm building. As soon as the door closed behind him, Mina and Kaminari bounded over to the window to watch where they were going. Looks like he's taking them to the main building. I wonder why, Mina said. Kirishima came up behind her and looked over her head out the window. Probably have to do paperwork and stuff. There's got to be a lot that goes into becoming students here when he used to be a villain. Chapter 18 Kids, this is Detective Tsukuji. He'll be interviewing you both individually, as you explained, introducing the unassuming man beside him. I understand that at this time you will likely not want to tell us everything, and that is okay, but we need some information on the League to show that you're serious about this agreement that we have. Does that make sense? Toga and Deku both nodded, looking nervously at the cop. This time, Toga was the one to hide behind Deku. She'd had many encounters with the police, none of them good, 
leaving her nervous around them. Tsukuchi didn't seem to mind her shyness, though. He gave them a kind smile before speaking. You two have been through a lot recently, so I won't be questioning you for long. Mostly, I'll just be asking about future plans that the League has. I will also be asking about some of the members. Deku, I understand that you write analysis. I'm hoping that you can do full write-ups on the League members for you and I to review together. I have those done already, Deku said in a quiet voice. I just need my notebook. Nezu pulled open a drawer on his desk and handed the notebook to Suguchi. I have reviewed what you have written, Deku, and I'm quite impressed, the principal said with a smile. I am so impressed that I'll be adding private lessons with me to your schedule so that we can improve upon your skills. Sukuchi flipped through the notebook, his brows steadily rising in surprise. You wrote all this? he asked. Yeah, it's been a hobby of mine since I was little. I I have a question, Deku said nervously. We got help from someone to escape. But if it got out that they helped us, they would get killed. I know you're going to ask about how we got here, but I'd rather not tell the police because then it has to go onto your report, and it could get leaked pretty easily. I told Nezu about it, though, so is that enough? Sukuchi nodded. That's enough for me. I understand that this is a unique situation. Come on. How about we go into the next room and we can discuss everything together? Deku and the detective left together, Toga's eyes following them until she couldn't see them anymore. As soon as they left her line of sight, her attention snapped to Nezu. Nezu gave her a smile before holding out a cup of tea for her. When she took it, she picked up the smell of pig's blood mixed with the ginger tea. Toga found herself smiling back at him. After dropping off the two teens with the principal, Mike went in search of his husband. It wasn't hard to find him. He just had to follow the sound of muffled cursing. Uh, Sho, what are you doing? Mike asked, standing in the door of their home office. Aizawa looked up, still awkwardly bent, trying to lift their desk. His hair was pulled back into a messy bun, and his shirt was starting to cling to him from the sweat. With a huff, he dropped the desk and straightened, a slight blush forming on his cheeks. I'm cleaning out the room. Want to tell me why you didn't ask for help? Figured I could do it myself. Uh-huh. You grab that end, I'll take the other. Together, they moved the heavy desk into the corner of the living room, ducked out of the way. Took them only a few minutes after that to clear out the office, leaving the room empty. Mike nodded and put his hands on his hips, feeling rather proud. Now we just need a bed, a dresser, and maybe a side table, and this should be all set for Aerie, Mike said. How is she, by the way? Aizawa sighed, letting his head fall. She's exhausted. She's been sleeping for a while now. She should wake up by tomorrow morning, though. We can take Deku and Toga to see her then. She was pretty freaked out about being away from them. Does she know she'll be staying with us? Not yet. We'll tell her later. I'll be honest, I'm worried about her and Deku both staying with us. I know it's for the best, but I'm worried about what influence he may have over her. Running a hand up Aizawa's arm, Mike let his husband lean into him. Aizawa pressed his head up under Mike's chin, much like a cat would. Mike smiled as he put his arms around him. It'll all be okay. I know Deku and Toga were with the League, and I know Toga hurt your students, but I can't help being reminded of us when I look at them. It's like seeing you, me, and Murray and Oberl all wrapped up into two kids. You think I don't see that, too? When I looked at Deku, all I saw was him, with the big eyes and the messy hair and the banged-up face. It was like I'd been thrown back in time. I don't want to see a repeat of Oboro. I know, Sho. It's going to be okay. We'll help them. With all of us pitching in, I think we could set them straight and keep them from getting hurt any worse than they already have been. I mean, I really don't think either of them particularly wanted to be criminals. And they obviously don't want Ari on the same path as they were. They gave up a lot for her. I don't think we need to worry about them teaching her anything too bad. At least not worse than anything you would teach her. That got a snort out of Aizawa. Nice to know my husband has such high opinions of me. Oh, so you won't be teaching Ari how to throw a proper right hook? Or how to break someone's fingers? When Aizawa said nothing, Mike laughed. Yeah, that's what I thought. How are you so calm about all this? Oh, I'm not calm at all. I just put on a front. Inside, I'm a mess of anxiety, energy drinks, and pure panic. That's really comforting. Thanks. Doesn't make my own anxiety spike at all. Happy to comfort you any time, babe. Hey, does Yue even have clothes that'll fit Ari? I'll go to the store later and get some stuff for all three of them. That's probably a good idea. Once both Toga and Deku finished their interviews with the detective, Nezu walked them to the 1B dorms, where they promptly hid away in Vlad King's apartment. They didn't want to run the risk of seeing any of the Hero Corps students, especially since Nezu informed them on the walkover that they'd be starting classes the next day. What about Ari? Deku asked, his brow furrowed in concern. When can I see her again? Nezu gave him a smile. Tomorrow, I promise. I have arranged for you three to have breakfast in Recovery Girl's office, where Ari will be staying tonight. 
Ladking will walk you both over first thing in the morning. Afterwards, he'll walk you both to my office for you to take some tests. We want to get an idea of where you are in your studies, so that, should you be behind, we can help you to catch up with your classmates. Once you finish with me, you will join 1A and 1B for their lessons. Now, I know you're both concerned, but I promise that you will both be safe. Your teachers will be making sure no one bothers either of you. And making sure we don't hurt anyone, Toga grumbled. Nezu, either not noticing her frustration or not caring, nodded. Yes, that as well. After lunch today, Recovery Girl will be coming to visit you both to check you over. Having been on your own for so long, it is possible that your health may have suffered. We want to make sure you're both well taken care of. Toga gave Nezu an odd look, almost as though she didn't fully believe him, but she didn't argue. Once the two were alone, Toku pressed a finger to his lips, gesturing for Toga to keep quiet. She gave a short nod, sitting down on the couch. Vlad King was out of his apartment, likely speaking with the other teachers, preparing everything for them to join the classes. A teacher would probably be coming to sit with them soon, since they weren't supposed to be alone, at least not for long. So Deku knew he had to make this fast. He did a quick sweep of the room, checking it for hidden cameras and microphones, not finding anything. He faced Toga. I'm not telling them everything about the League, he said in a hushed voice. Toga cocked her head. What do you mean? I thought we have to tell them everything for the deal to work. Maybe I'll tell the rest in the future, but I just don't feel like I have it all figured out yet. It's, it's like there are pieces of the puzzle missing, you know? It's like knowing where the end of the maze is, but not being able to figure out the path to it, because it makes no sense. That's why I wanted to talk with you. You were with the League before me. What can you tell me about Shigaraki Sensei? She shrugged, though she seemed to be mulling his question over in her head. Never seen him. Only ever heard his voice through the computer thingy. I think Shigaraki was, like, raised by him or something, because I heard them talking about when Shigaraki was a kid once, and it sounded like a sensei had been there. Kuragiri basically took care of Shigaraki when he was a kid, I know that much. That's another thing, Deku said, starting to pace. Usually, when a quirk has a mutation aspect, it's related to the quirk's function. Kuragiri creates those warp gates, but why is his entire body covered in the stuff? We know he has a body under there, since he and Shigaraki mentioned once about him getting pinned and about how UA kids tried to use their quirk on his body. It would make more sense for him to cover himself in the wispy stuff only when he was going to do villain work. That way he could go to the store and stuff as a normal guy and not be recognized, but he's covered in it all the time. It's like the quirk took his body over. That doesn't make sense. Exactly, that's why I didn't bring it up. Same with Shigaraki's quirk. Something just seems off about it. Can't put my finger on it. The others are pretty straightforward, though I didn't tell them everything about Dobby. Like the bullet? Toga asked. Oh, I'm never telling them about that. Dobby hates Endeavor, not in the way that he hates other false heroes. That is some personal shit that I don't even really want to unpack. And after seeing Endeavor yell at his youngest son at the sports festival, I think I have an idea of why Dobby hates Endeavor. Are you going to tell me? Not yet. Like I said, I'm missing a piece of the puzzle. I just need to figure some things out. Just... Don't tell them what I just told you, and don't tell them about Dobby's quirk hurting his body, at least not yet. Toga straightened in her seat, looking concerned. What do you mean it's hurting him? Deku sighed, running his fingers through his hair. The fire's too hot for his body. I don't know if it's that Dobby wasn't born with fireproof skin, or if it's another problem, but basically his quirk is burning him. I've told him a million times that he needs to get support items, or medication, or something to help with it, but he always just blew me off. To be honest, Pretty sure he thinks that he isn't going to survive taking out Endeavor. Maybe with the bullet he can. Maybe. Out of everyone that was left in the League, he was the least shitty, Deku laughed. Twice was cool. Yeah, I guess he wasn't too bad. A knock at the door caught their attention, promptly ending the conversation. Before either could say anything, the door creaked open, and Midnight poked her head in. Hey guys, I brought some UA school uniforms for you two to try on. Once we figure out what size you wear, we can get you a couple pairs so that you have enough during the weeks. That sound good? They took turns in the spare bedroom, which was to be Toga's room, trying on the school uniforms. When they would step out for midnight to check the uniform over, making sure it fit them right, she would get an odd look on her face. Deku narrowed his eyes at her while she fussed over his uniform jacket. Toga was eyeing him carefully, picking up on his discomfort. Why do you pity us? He asked, his voice harsh. Then I looked taken aback at his words. What? I can see it on your face. I don't know what we did to make you pity us, and I want to know why. Oh, hon, I don't pity you. Not at all. I'm worried about you both. Toga tensed beside Deku. Worried about us? Why? How do I say this nicely? Midnight mumbled, frowning. Listen, you two are really skinny. You guys are underweight, concerningly so. And the uniforms are loose on you in a way that it shows how skinny you both are. 
Yeah, but why are you so worried about us? We're villains. With a small smile, Midnight reached out to run her hand over Toga's hair. Toga flinched away. Midnight rose, seeing the fear in Toga's eyes. Her smile turned sad as she let her hand fall. Because above everything else, you guys are kids. Sure, you made bad choices, and we can't trust you two just yet. But with some work on both of our ends, we'll get you guys on the right path. Now, change out of those so that you don't mess them up. I'll text Vlad to pick up some more in these sizes for the two of you. Recover Girl should be here soon to give you guys checkups. While we wait, I can make you two something to eat and we can watch TV. How does that sound? Can I use a computer? Deku asked, giving her a faux innocent smile. Nice try. Go get changed. Recovery Girl arrived not long after they finished eating to give them a full checkover. As she worked, her frown grew deeper and deeper. She looked at all their scars, new and old, along with drawing some blood to run some tests. Toga had to forcefully drag her gaze away from the tubes of blood to focus on Recovery Girl inspecting her limbs and joints. Once Recovery Girl was done, she gave both teens a handful of vitamins and supplement pills before pulling Midnight into the hall to talk. As soon as the door shut behind them, Toga and Deku were scurrying across the room and pressing their ears to the door. It was muffled, but they managed to make out what the women were saying. Those two are far too thin, and the amount of scars they have, especially the boy, is concerning. He has scorch marks on his body that appear to be old. Eraserhead mentioned that you know the boy's identity now. Any idea where those marks came from? Recovery Girl asked, worry laced in her tone. Were the scars normal burn marks, or were they starburst-shaped? Starburst? How did you know? Midnight sighed. Bakugo and Deku were childhood friends, and it seems that Deku was bullied by Bakugo. Mercilessly so. We'll need to talk to Nezu about what to do, and both Deku and Toga have been homeless for a while. Toga for much longer, so it's not a surprise that they're thin. How bad is it, though? They're malnourished and dehydrated. I'll be creating meal plans for both of them to work on getting them back to a healthy weight. Toga may also have a few toes, maybe a finger that were broken in the past and have healed wrong. Once she has her strength up, I'll want to realign those. She has symptoms of anemia, but I think it's due to a lack of blood in her diet. That can be easily fixed. I want to run some tests on the samples I took to make sure they don't have any illnesses, but besides that, I think they're physically okay. Emotionally and mentally could be another story. They're incredibly distrustful of adults, especially authority figures. Therapy could help, but it'll take time before they feel safe enough to open up. What do you suggest we do to help them get comfortable here? Midnight asked. To be honest, I have no idea. The best advice I can give is to be patient. There was a shuffling noise, which Deku recognized as Recover Girl leaving. He grabbed Toga's arm and yanked her back to the couch, where they quickly began acting as though they'd been discussing vitamins the whole time. Midnight came back in seconds later, smiling at them both and offering to get them glasses of water to wash down the pills. Vlad King arrived not long after, bags in hand. Trotting along beside him was a wrinkly, grumpy-faced bulldog with an underbite that rivaled Vlad's. When Toga saw the dog, she shrieked and jumped up from the couch, flailing her hands excitedly. She didn't rush the dog, thankfully, since Deku figured that would have startled Vlad King and possibly gotten her in trouble. A puppy? She screeched, her eyes sparkling. What's his name? Does he know any tricks? This is Captain, Vlad King said, eyeing Toga cautiously. He knows how to sit, but that's it. He doesn't do much, really. Midnight laughed. Yeah, Captain's too lazy. All he wants to do is eat and sleep. Captain, almost as if he was trying to prove Midnight's point, had waddled further into the apartment and collapsed onto the carpet. Within seconds, he was snoring. Can I pet him? Toga asked, dancing from foot to foot like she couldn't contain her excitement. When Vlad gave her a nod, she dropped down to the floor, next to Captain, and gently ran a hand over his head. He cracked one eye open, glanced at her, and then closed it again. Toga stared in awe. Since most animals were scared of her, the fact that Captain wasn't, growling or moving away from her was like a miracle to her. Leaning down, Toga began whispering to him. You are amazing, Captain. I would kill anyone for you, because you're such a good boy. I'd even die for you. We're going to be best friends, okay? Deku looked up at Vlad and in a deadpan voice said, Congratulations. Captain has a guardian for life now. Vlad blinked at them a few times, trying to take in everything they had said before awkwardly holding out the bags. These have your uniforms and supplies in them. I also got some extra blankets and pillows for you both. Deku, I mean, Midori. I mean, kid, what do I call you? Deku frowned, averting his eyes. He gave a small shrug. Aw, Deku-kun, it's okay, Toga said, coming up to give him a hug. Do you still want to be Deku? I know it might be weird since Bakugo was the one who called you that. We can have everyone else call you Midoriya, or if that feels weird, we can all call you Izuku. It'll be like old days. I think Deku's fine for now. I mean... I'm still kind of a criminal, you know. Having people continue to call you Deku won't inspire them to trust you, Vlad said. You might want to go by your legal name so they can learn to separate you from what the League called you. 
Katja, I mean, Bakuga will still call me Deku no matter what, so it doesn't matter. Just call me whatever you want. With a sigh, Vlad nodded. Well, if you're okay with it, I'll call you Midoriya. But listen, since you'll be staying here for a while until you move to the 1A dorms, I also got you a couple pair of pajamas. You can keep them and the extra blankets and stuff here for when you feel like coming to stay with Toga. You're welcome over here whenever you want. Just give me a heads up and have someone walk you over, got it? Deku nodded, taking the bags from Vlad's hands. They were heavier than they looked, dwarfed in Vlad King's massive hands. Deku's arms had dropped as he had took the weight of the bags, puffing as he tried to lift them. Toga hurried over and took a few from him. We have all the paperwork set up for you two to start school tomorrow, Vlad continued. Nezu's still working to track down any living family members you two have, so we can alert them about where you are. And, hey, don't make those faces. We have to tell them where you are and that you're now wards of UA. It's literally the law. Go unpack that stuff and get settled. All right, listeners. This concludes Chapter 18 of Reformation. Chapter 19 will be next. I hope you all are still enjoying this fic, and as always, thank you so much for listening.